My name is Franck Cretanier. I am a, an artist and a curator um, of Gang and Gehaga and French ancestry. So my family is orig originally from, from Quebec and um, I've been living uh, on the beautiful land of the Sinek people where I'm talking to you from today. So um, more specifically, the unceded territory of the Tsikkim First Nation um, in a place now called Sydney by the sea. So we are just by uh, on, the, on the little peninsula on Vancouver Island, uh, just by the Salish Sea. And it's an absolutely uh, gorgeous land. And um, my name is Chris Creighton Kelly. And along with France, we are the two co-directors of Primary Colors. My own background is um, both South Asian and British, so I'm what used to be called an Anglo-Indian, and I too am, am so grateful to be an uninvited guest on this territory. We also work uh, and live in Victoria, BC. We're about half an hour away from Victoria, which is also the unceded territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, which includes the Esquimalt and the Songhees nations as they're known today. And uh, like France, I'm very grateful to be here. It's a lovely part of the world. Well, I was trained as a visual artist um, and I started my work in the Artist Run Center movement. I was the co-founder of an Artist Run Center back in the 80s. Um, and um, I've, I've had a practice as a visual artist for a long time. I've been, um, I think maybe shifting more to multidisciplinary practice, including media in my work, um, and uh, then um, out of necessity, I think, uh, came to curation. Um, and I think that this practice has informed the work that I do, that we do at Primary Colors in the sense that uh, the idea of curation for me is, is, comes from the idea of care, of caring for uh, people, caring for um, the spaces that we occupy and caring for the art, the, the ideas that, that we present, so what the artist comes forward with. Um, and in that spirit of care, I think that the work, it really, it's the foundation of the work that we do at Primary Colors, creating spaces of, of care, spaces where people can, indigenous, uh, black and people of color can come together um, in, in productive spaces uh, and safe spaces, safe fur spaces. Um, to um, to talk about the state of their practice today and and how we are shaping the Canadian art system and and our place in it and and our place in in the history of, of the arts in, in Canada. That's a short answer. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's always difficult to talk about oneself because. You know, you can really indulge yourself, but I'll try my best to just touch a couple of highlights to uh, to try to answer to you about artistic practice. Um, France used the word multidisciplinary, and I don't want to get lost in the weeds on these words, but for a long time, actually almost all my artistic career, I have thought of myself as an interdisciplinary artist. And there's a distinction between these two things. Multidisciplinary, and I know what France means by that, is a person who does a, France has some massive drawings in her studio right now, but she's also working with augmented reality. And she also writes. There are different uh, aspects. Interdisciplinary, on the other hand, is bringing together elements of different artistic uh, traditions uh, in a way that may or may not, depending on the success of the artist, um, create something new. That, that's the difference between interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. So I've always been trying to do that. And I think that comes from my past as a hybrid person. It comes from being, uh, you know, a university person, a university trained person, but also learning sitar when I was young and learning at the feet of gurus. And because learning, as you both know, learning doesn't just happen in universities or colleges. It happens all the time in a day to day practice. And for me, my actual uh, training is in communications. I have communications degrees. But along the way, I've taken all kinds of courses in various, I've played in bands, I've done all kinds of activities. Um, and I'm constantly trying, mostly these days in performance, 
I do not like the term performance art, um, to create an environment uh, where people can discover something about themselves rather than about me imparting knowledge to them. How that informs primary colors is that as a person of color and as a person who has been working for a long, long time, like 40 years, to look at the Canadian art system and see who it excludes, we felt, and it's not me, it's together us and with our colleagues, that the old stale conversations about multiculturalism and uh, access and inclusion and all this rhetoric that is used that accomplishes very little needed to be updated. And we needed to talk about anti-racist technologies, sorry, methodologies, pardon me, and, and also very importantly, decolonizing methodology. To answer directly, it, the artistic practice, and I always think of it this way, is not just the work that takes place in a theater or in a gallery. It's, it, I think of the artist as a facilitator. The artist is bringing people together. France said it perfectly a few minutes ago, creating spaces for, and one thing about what she said that she didn't say is when we bring people together, we're not necessarily centering whiteness. There's a really unfortunate situation in this country where whiteness is always at the center, even if we're talking about indigenous people, even if we're talking about black and people of color. So we wanted to decenter that. It's not, it's not like we don't like white people. We even invited a few of them to <laughs> our events, but we want the conversation to be about the hidden stories and the hidden connections and make new connections among indigenous artists, their practices, and the practice of black and people of color. That's a, probably a more complete answer to how we came to be where we are today. Oh, we're changing the world. Like we, <laughs> go, you go. Well, I think um, one of the things that we, we do, and, and we haven't done obviously in the past year, but it's bringing people together. So creating hosting gatherings um, where can, people can spend time together. Um, and as Chris was saying, uh, when you bring people together and you're not centering whiteness, really inter interesting stuff happens, right? And the conversation doesn't have to go back always to the basics. So, so, so the, it, it creates a space for people to connect in so many different ways and having, and I'm not saying that these are easy conversations because it's complicated, right? It's, it's, it's complex, it's multi-layered, uh, but we, we really try hard to um, use methodologies that we call polyvocal, so creating space for many voices, and even when those voices are dissonant or, or discordant, we, we welcome that. It's okay. Um, we value actually the different positions. And again, it's working from um, a, a methodology of, of the circle where every point of the circle has a value. And so we value each, each other's experiences. Um, and we also value the embodied uh, knowledge that we all have. Uh, so these are some of the, the decolonial methodologies that we activate when we, we come together. And I think um, some of the um, uh, benefits, I guess, or the outcomes of, of some of the work that we have done um, it has been really to create new networks and to create alliances. And I think there has been a lot of bridge building in, in bringing different communities, sometimes like even in the indigenous world, uh, indigenous community, French as, the, as their colonial language, um, are often uh, unknown by the indigenous communities who have English as their colonial language. So there is a linguistic divide uh, among indigenous people, but also among black people and, and people of color, communities of color. So by, by bringing different communities, I think that we are um, allowing um, that connection to, 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 to uh, be there, to foster. Um, and we've seen over the years now how much generative um, this networking has been where uh, scholars, artists, historians have decided to work on specific projects as they, they've been visiting, as people have regrouped and create, um, you know, localized projects. So 
there's a multitude of, of impacts and, and maybe, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the incubation project. I could, yeah, I could, yeah, sure. This thing that France is talking about, about polyvocality and people speaking, we're at a very interesting moment in history right now. And both of you know this because you're young and the way you encounter and, and, and deal with, the, with what you deal with in your daily lives, where a lot of voices that have historically been silenced and marginalized are speaking. And for once, they're actually being heard, even if it's a little bit. Another part of the work we do, and I will get to incubation projects briefly, but we also look at the institutions of Canada and how they replicate the, the power structure. So we spend a good deal of our time talking about Canadian culture. We just got off a call before you talking about uh, a specific museum that we're working with and how those uh, positionalities are, are replicated in the day-to-day -day work. And, and for that matter, how they came to be. Why is it that we you know, have this arts and culture system the way it is, that is so Eurocentric that we're like, why are we even having to have this conversation? Shouldn't these institutions be reflecting the people who live on this territory called Canada? I suspect both of you have roots in other countries. You know exactly what I'm talking about. So that's a really like an ongoing problematic. And some institutions in Canada are trying their best to accommodate this and to learn, accommodates the wrong word, to change. Others are resisting like, like it's day one of all this. So the decolonizing work that we do is also that. It's both personal, as France described, and decolonizing our minds and the way we interact with one another, but it's also decolonizing institutions. And there's even a question, can an institution even be decolonized? And one of the strategies, to be more specific about methodologies, is something we call incubation projects, where we seed money into small, pro well, not small, but smaller projects that are very locally based. And there's a few of them across that are Canada. emerging from communities. Right. So we meet somewhere in Winnipeg or Halifax or whatever. Somebody goes, you know, well, it would be really good if we could. Da, 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 da. OK, well, we can throw five grand at that or whatever. And it's always small amounts, but we see it as seed money to get something going. And then we provide a little bit of advice and the thing just goes on its own. Some have been really, really successful. Others, not so much. But it's not even about that, about their success. It's about seeding conversations and projects. It's for all of us to imagine, right? That's what we're doing. In a way, that's why we're talking, because we're imagining what this future is going to look like. We're going to, you know, what, 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 what can it be? Um, and one of the... Um, one of the things I think is important in this work of imagining what the, you know, in the colonial future, what will the arts look like is um, for us to understand what the colonial project was about and how it functioned um, and how it was constructed and how it has created lens that have become invisible, um, the Western but are still very operative. Um, and, and I think that wanting to jump quickly to the, the decolonial future without understanding how this huge edifice was built um, can lead us to, to very shallow solutions. Um, and I know it's boring and sometimes it's like, you know, <laughs> um, to, to have to look back at history and sometimes it's not very comfortable because it's not a very pretty story sometimes, right? Some pretty nasty stuff has happened and, and we have to own that. And so it's, it's, it's not just a, um, a process that is outside of ourselves as individuals. It's, we have to embody that. And, and we, we, we carry our ancestors with us every day, right? And so we have to embody their story. We have to embody, they, we, we are embodying that story, but to better understand it in a way that uh, will make sure that we will transform it in a positive way. So paying attention to history, paying attention to how this was made uh, is, is paramount. And, and, and this is why telling the stories is so important and not just the story of the, the Western art and the Western cultures, uh, but all of those stories that are alive on the land right now. 
um, for me, that's the way. That that's what is is leading us uh, to to better understand where all of that comes from. Because that's show you cannot understand where you're going if you don't know where you're coming from. I think, um, and and paying attention to where we're coming from together um, is is uh, for me a beacon of, of of light and and hope for for the future. It's for all of us to imagine it and to make sure that there's a space for all of our imagination in that new place, right? I know it sounds a little hopeful, um, but, but that's the dream, right? We have to dream big and we have to, to keep that, that, um, that faith in, in, in what is possible. And I'm, I'm an, an optimistic and mainly because of, of you because of, of your generations and, and the work that you're gonna you're gonna do. Shall we start with the cultural genocide <laughs> that was perpetrated here? Maybe that's the place we need to start, right? Um, and I, I'm not trying to be dramatic here, but it's just the truth. Um, unfortunately, you know, there's a um, Mike McDonald was a Mi'kmaq artist. He is still a Mi'kmaq artist, but he's passed now. And he um, he quoted one of his elders uh, who was who was telling to him. Um, the elder said, "Mike, you know the real tragedy of Canada is not really about uh, the residential schools, and it's not because you know it's not really that children was prevented from speaking their own languages. Or the scoop. Or... Uh, the real tragedy of this country is that the newcomers didn't adopt the cultures of here. And I think it really encapsulates um, the, in, in a way, the tragedy of, of it all, where you had people coming here who didn't understand what they were encountering. And they, they totally misunderstood. Um, what what they were seeing, and and because of um, <laughs> because of Christianity, because of the idea that they were in, in presence of vanishing races, because that's what they thought at the time, that they were savages, that were just a you know a, a um, uh, uncivilized population that was just on the brinks of extinction, um, and that gave them the permission to just take the land and and take the objects, and sometimes even takes human remains to put them in their museums, um, and and they didn't see the um, they didn't see the art. Um, they 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 declassified. So the Western art lands had a way to declassify the arts of here. So the art forms became either uh, artifacts, uh, so objects to be put in museums, or they became craft, and therefore they had no place in 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 institutions art, or art, art galleries yeah. or or any of that. And it seems like ancient history, but we had to wait in this country uh, until the 70s and 80s for indigenous artists to be considered as professional artists. So, and to this day, I would say that we're still living with um, the legacies of, of these views. Um, and a concrete example is the fact that um, when the, uh, this country, Canada, decided to um, build its arts infrastructure. So there was a moment, we call it the, the, the nation building Cultural nation. period. Cultural nation. Um, where the country decided to invest in museums, in art galleries, in theaters, in concert halls, like all of the infrastructure that was that is there still to support the arts in Canada. The, the libraries, the publishing houses, archives. all of it, the archives, all of that, when all of that was built and a lot of, of resources was invested in, in, in that effort, the understanding of what art was, was completely excluding indigenous art. It was mainly Western art. So we have in Canada, a whole system that was built to support foreign European art forms. And so we're still today, this is, this is you know, what artists are still struggling with because there is no indigenous museum. There is no indigenous national gallery. There's no indigenous theater. 
We're still although there is an Inuit well, one, there's an Inuit. We're one. still just struggling to start to build an infrastructure to support the artistic production and the presentation of of those art forms. So you know, it's it's a, a big. We have a huge deficit in terms of infrastructure, and that has a huge impact, direct impact, on the capacity of of indigenous artists to produce work and and to present it. Um, and despite all of that, um, the indigenous arts in this country are thriving in every discipline and, and they, they are presented around the world and they, um, they are appreciated around the world. So it's a story of resilience. It's a story of, of um, strength um, and, and incredible um, artistic uh, uh, strength and, and power and merit. Um, Good question. Well, maybe I should just mention that these five R's, which are respect, responsibility, uh, relationality, Rel relevance. relevance, and reciprocity, um, they're, are, they're not ours. Are big words, yeah. uh, big concepts, and big guiding principles that have been developed uh, by many uh, indigenous scholars. Uh, mainly in the field of research. So Linda Highsmith and Sean Wilson and, and many, many others um, have contributed to this. And really it, 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 it um, was developed in a more scholarly context, but uh, we've been working with, the, I've been working with those five R's in my own practice as an artist and as a curator, uh, because I find that, um, Although it might seem very simple, those five R's, those five words, um, to work with them, to activate them in any project that I undertake uh, is a very stringent and rigorous process. Um, and it's like a grid, um, you know, because sometimes we have these ideas of, of um, you know, a creative project or a collaboration or a partnership or wanting to engage a community. Um, and it seems so relevant to us, right? It's so important and we get really excited and, and we want to do it. Um, but, but to go through uh, the process of looking at, okay, what's, what's a respectful position with, you know, with, with this community or with this project or with this idea? And what are my responsibilities in there? And this project might be relevant to me, but how is it relevant to the people I want to work with or I want to partner with? So, so especially really, when they tell you we don't want to do this, then what do you do? So really using them as as a as a grid, as a moment of reflection, and and it allows um, it allows me anyway in my practice to um, be thoughtful and to build in from the onset uh, ways of relating uh, to to the people I'm going to be working with. And making sure that I'm not just going somewhere or either imposing my ideas or just taking, doing res resource extraction or knowledge extraction. What's what's in how what what am I leaving? What is what is the reci reciprocal relationship here? And how am I nurturing this relationship? Because uh, you know, in indigenous communities for mm, decades, centuries. Um, people would just go in and still happening. People go in in a community, they want to do a project or they, they have a research project or whatever. Uh, they do their thing and then they leave. Um, and then the community stays there, right? And, and so activating those guiding principles is, is a way of making sure that you nurture relationships ahead of time during the project, but also after. It, it goes back to the epistemological understanding of memory. Oh boy, you're going to go there. Well, huh? <laughs> right? How is memory constructed? Like, yeah. What is memory? And what is it that we want to remember and for whom and how? Right? So if you come from an, uh, a culture uh, that is based in orality, uh, the responsibility of remembering takes a very different shape, right? We're on the west coast of Canada right now, where in, in some communities here, um, there's a, a function for people. There's a role that is called witnessing. They're witnesses. 
and it's a real thing. It's not just, oh, I was there. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's people that have the responsibility of remembering an event in all its details. And, and that's without person, writing it down all from memory. And, and, and those people, when you accept the responsibility of being a witness, you can be called upon by that community as long as you live. And you have a responsibility of transmitting that memory to your, your, the people after you. So there's a huge like millennial tradition of, of how we handle memory. Um, and then, so, so this has been disrupted somewhat, although it's still, it's still happening. Um, but I think that our idea of archiving, of preserving memory, um, has been uh, objectified in a way. And therefore the critique of a multi, uh, the, the critique of one version of history is not enough because we have to begin to think about how do the various narratives of history come together to aggregate into something bigger. So if, if I say, you know, I want to understand history uh, from an Indian point of view. I want to know what happened in India. And I know quite a bit about Indian history, but I don't know very much compared to some people. And then I incorporate, oh, okay, so that happened. So when the British went there, to, but then that teaches me nothing about Norwegian history or the history of Antarctica or the history of birds. So it's really a huge conceptual thing to try to understand all of that in a new way. And your generation is going to have to really deal with that. And especially people like you that are, moving around and that are hybrid and that, you know, you've got more than one culture to deal with. And that is the deepest irony of all, because the people that are most useful to figure that out are people who are biracial, who come from different backgrounds, who have traveled, who've lived in different countries. We are the ones that have knowledge of Western history and other histories. And yet the people that only know about white history, Eurocentric history, they're the ones that mostly are in charge. So it's a really problematic thing because their perspective is limited. Well, I think the project that Chris was just mentioning, um, telling all our stories is certainly uh, an ambition, ambitious, uh, big project for, for primary colors. Um, and we've been um, trying to also adapt our ways of working to the realities of the pandemic. Um, so it has had an impact, but dreaming that project, I think, mm -hmm. is, is, is the next big step and, and it can be an important contribution to, uh, to many communities um, and to the scholarship around, around these questions as well, um, coming from outside universities um, and, and using different approaches, methodologies. So that, that'd, be, um, that'd be my answer. As for the future of uh, the arts from IBPOC, I think that um, it's a bright future. I mean, I think that we are, um, you know, in the past year, I really feel that the tectonic, tectonic plates have moved um, and, and there's a real shift that is happening that I've, I've, I'm witnessing. There's stuff happening right now that I didn't think would happen in my lifetime. And that makes me feel very, very, very hopeful. One other project, it's a smaller project, is when uh, George Floyd was murdered. Um, there was a lot of performative allyship going on about, you know, uh, we'd like to take a stand against racism and this kind of, we didn't do that uh, for a number of reasons. But, you know, as if people of color or black people need to know that racism is bad, they already know. So we didn't want to get involved with making ourselves look good by, taking a stand. We already take a stand against racism in every single thing that we do. So we waited and we decided to listen a bit. We talked with many of our black colleagues that we work with um, and three messages came from those informal and formal conversations. One, we need to work uh, with black artists, which we already did. So we felt like, okay, we can tick that box. We, we did that. Then the second one was center black artists more put them more, give them more opportunities, let them speak more, back off and let them be the ones like we do with indigenous artists. So we reflected on that because we felt like we could do better there. Um, and I'll tell you briefly about the project that came out of it. And then the third one, which is the hardest one, is because of where we situate primary colors in this kind of 
uh, dialogue between indigenous black and people of color, um, that there's anti-black racism within our own communities. We have a project that we're gonna launch on the first anniversary of George Floyd's murder um, called uh, Black Lives Matter equals Black Art Matters. And we're going to have uh, some indigenous, you, you'll be, it'll be on our website. Sorry, not indigenous, black artists talking about that, speaking about that without editorial comment from us. We'll just create the context and people will speak. And we can go on and on about our projects. There are many um, that we have in cooking right now. But as Franz said, the pandemic has set back a few things. It's set back our funding. It's set back our ability to be in rooms with people. We have to be very cautious because we're old and we don't want to die. <laughs> <laughs> That's something that it's not just useful for the various communities we work in, because many of our white colleagues, probably people that teach both of you in institutions, universities and colleges are always saying, you know what, we're tired of teaching Eurocentric art. So we want to we want to open what we do. We want to show other, but we don't know where to go to find this. There's no books about South Asian art practice in Canada. You might find the odd article if you spend hours on Google, but you know, it's- well, They might know though. Oh, they might know, <laughs> of course. Of course. I can they... see, I can see the- <laughs> <laughs> The point is- <laughs> The search engine going. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, are, there are articles and thanks to multiculturalism, we have abundant articles about when did everybody come here and where did they come from? You can find all of that. What you rarely find is when people came to this territory, what happened to their art practices and how did they evolve when they were here? And that's what we're trying to, the art aspect of that question, not who eats what food, not that there's anything wrong with food, but it's, it's more about the art practices. So I think people have, uh, all kinds of people have a hunger for that knowledge. 